A thick fog draped over Lake Huron in the early morning as the Choctaw, carrying a full cargo and 30 crewmen, rushed northbound from Cleveland. The steamer Wakanda was on a southerly course, speeding off the coast of Thunder Bay. The Wakanda emerged from the fog without warning. When the Wakanda circled back, they found only silence on the waters of what would later be known as Shipwreck Alley. The Great Lakes are a vast water highway for tens of thousands of ships and millions of voyages, making it one of the world's busiest and most dangerous waterways. Industry on these lakes and their connecting rivers not only gave rise to major US cities such as Chicago, Detroit, and New York City, but also sustained smaller economies like the historic shipbuilding town of Saginaw, Michigan. It's from there that five high school students were chosen for Project Ship Hunt to work alongside the leading experts in ocean exploration from NOAA and Woods Hole. Their mission is to travel to Shipwreck Alley to discover a shipwreck and solve a hundred-year-old mystery. I always said, I would never go on a ship. Too scary, but going on a ship, it's kind of terrifying. I'm a small town guy. I've never done something this big. I signed up for adventure, and that's exactly what I got. I was born in Saginaw, Michigan. When people think of Michigan, they think of Motown. They think of the automotive industry. With the demise of it, comes a heavy blow to the economy within this area. Several years ago, we had a lot of people leave Saginaw because there was a, a lack of job opportunity. And so that caused us to lose a lot of our students. So when we have fewer students, there's fewer dollars. So it's our role to educate our students with what we have. Our way of thinking about how we educate kids and what we hope for them needs to be just as imaginative as the technology that is driving everything. When I heard about the Ship Hunt Project, I thought what an amazing opportunity for our students to merge education, technology, and history. It's hard to get kids involved doing pencil and paper stuff. And so when they can see what the pencil and paper stuff can lead them to, that's where the magic happens. Has come. Really excited. Can't wait. <laughs> this is what education really should be about. Putting them up on a stage and letting them bring all of their skills. I'm Cody Frost. I'm small town guy. I've never done something this big. Good afternoon, all auto. After school, I'll go see what my dad's up to, see if he needs any help. When I was five years old, my mom passed away from cancer. My brother kind of took me under his wing, and he really showed me what not to do. I live every day for what that day is because if I really look forward to the future, I mean, it might not be there. I'm very excited for you. Who knows what this could lead to? You don't, you don't know. This could open up a whole new world for him. This project found it fun. We was gonna do something out of the box, something different, something that people from Saginaw don't normally do. People will vote me like most likely to become president or something like that. I'm usually the person who has straight A's and that's how they see me and expect me to be all the time like I'm not gonna make any mistakes. My mom, she perfect. She might brag too much. I don't call it bragging. You know mothers don't call it bragging. They call it excited about what their kids have accomplished. I have to do well, cause then I'm letting other people down. Her counselor says are going to What's the name of school? Harvard. Harvard. That's my baby. 
Welcome to Alpena and the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. How you doing? Are you ready to hunt for a ship? Yes. yes. All right, cool. Here in Thunder Bay, we protect shipwrecks, and our job is to preserve them, to understand them archaeologically, historically, and most of all, make them accessible to the public. Thunder Bay is a massive water highway. Bad weather, fog, human error, accidents are bound to happen. Hence, we're Shipwreck Alley. We don't want to develop a passion in these students for not just shipwrecks, but for the sense of exploration. So the way we've got it set up, there's everything you need here. Uh, on this side are a couple of bedrooms, and those are free for you guys to sort of divide up. I got this. How are you going to get up there? Ah. I was like, wow, we're going to be staying in a museum. <laughs> it's so cool. Well, I want to be a successful writer. I want to be editor-in-chief of a popular um, environmental journal. I published a children's book um, last February. It's called The Monster in the Basement. Me and my little sister did the illustrations as well. My favorite subjects are math and science. And I feel like those subjects would be really beneficial to Project Chip Hunt. She's always just strive to do her best. No matter what she does, she's always 110% all the time. Hey, guys. Hey. I'm Dr. James Delgado. I'm an archaeologist. I've been working at this for about 32 years, worked on sites all over the country and around the world. And just last summer, I was the chief scientist on the mission to scientifically map the Titanic. Awesome. Amazing. <laughs> NOAA's a big agency. It's up in space with satellites, looking at weather, mapping the coasts, and also exploring. In fact, ocean exploration and research in NOAA has a mission which is simply stated to boldly go. Out here at Thunder Bay, there's a lot of shipwrecks, but not all of them have been found. And so what we're going to do is go find one. We're looking for a very specific shipwreck. Her name is Choctaw. She sank in 1915. It was a foggy July night in Shipwreck Alley, the visibility less than 100 feet. The Choctaw was rushing north from Cleveland to deliver its cargo of coal. The steamer Wakanda emerged from the fog without warning. She drove her bow deep into the port side of the ill-fated Choctaw. As the Choctaw took on water, its stern rose into the air. The ship eventually flipped to its starboard side and sank to the lake floor, where she would elude ship hunters for the next hundred years. I want you to meet Stan Stock. He's been looking for this wreck for a while. Stan. It's a pleasure to be here. I picked the Choctaw because hopefully this was going to be an easy target to find. And little did I know that 20 years later, I'd still be looking for the Choctaw. I'm a, what they call a weekend warrior. Every weekend I can, I'm out searching and diving for shipwrecks. And one of the wrecks was the Choctaw. And uh, I was very interested in it because it was a semi-whaleback design, steel hull, and only three were ever built. This particular sonar is from 1993. It's just a single beam sonar. It sends out a single beam that bounces off the bottom and comes back up. Noah, uh, their sonar is pinging out multiple beams in a much larger cone. So in this depth of water, they're pinging out about 1,500 feet wide versus my 200 feet wide. The shaded areas are the particular areas I've searched already for the Choctaw. One of the reasons I kind of ended the search area up at this end of the grid because at the time, the depths were so great. These memory sticks have a file on them that tells you about the Choctaw, how it was built, some newspaper articles about the sinking, some other documents. With all of this, what you guys have are different pieces of the puzzle, and they're going to be really key to helping us figure out not only where to look, but what that target might prove to be. And yes, there will be adventure. <laughs> We know 5% of the sea floor, 95% of it yet untapped, undiscovered. It is the final frontier. And so for these kids to know that everything hasn't been done is powerful. My job was to find out all the information about how the Choctaw sunk. OK, so the, this, it went like this, and then it flipped over. I had to do 
who was the crew and if there was any witness accounts about the wreckage, where was it? For a crash course, that was a lot of information. I'm 17, I've been at Arthur Hill for two years and I'm a junior, uh, sophomore. <laughs> if it's Wednesday or Friday, I usually end up going to my grandmother's. I try to help her out and see if she needs anything done, keep her company. <laughs> she does have Alzheimer's, but uh, she's dealing with it. He comes and takes care of me ever since he was little. I, I raised him, now he takes care of me. For a strange reason, I have a gift when it comes to video games. Games are not used for nothing. They can teach your kid how to strategize and outthink a person, even a computer. There's things you can apply games to in real life and history-wise. OK, guys, each of you is given an assignment and asked to look at one part of this. Together, as a team, you're going to combine your knowledge. There were sightings from the lighthouse of the cabin floating. We each picked a spot where we thought the Choctaw was. I'm thinking that it would have flipped towards this direction and went straight down. And then after that, we drew a box around our different locations, and we made sure that everyone's location was inside of the box. I have to say I was really impressed when I saw you draw the box. We all got together and drew a box that was actually a little bigger than this and went out and took some multi-beam. Multi-beam sonar sends out a swath of sound that bounces off the seafloor and helps determine the depth and topography below the ship. As the seafloor deepens, the multi-beam's range increases, making it a useful tool when mapping large areas. We conduct searches in linear directions, painting the seafloor with sound, then processing the data and converting it into three-dimensional maps. We covered about 150 miles of multi-beam sonar data, which is coincidentally how far it is from Thunder Bay to Saginaw, Michigan. There's a lot of area. <laughs> there is a lot of area. Shipwreck hunting years ago was a hobby. Just mapping the seafloor was a very different thing than it is now. What now is encompassed in a laptop was once something that would fill an entire room that was inaccessible to us on ships. And now we're able to take millions of data points that we collect from sonar, run them through a processor, and come out with these maps that really enable us to peer down thousands of feet to find shipwrecks. We had to look around until we found something that looked irregular or unnatural. We really, really had to find something, and it wasn't happening. But then I seen a small bump it's kind of long, and it's sticking out on both sides. See this? Oh, where did you find that one? That's interesting. Is it shaped like anything natural? No. That's definitely the target of interest. There's a target that we've got that we can go side scan. Oh, oh. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, I, I was really excited. What do you guys say about going out tomorrow and taking a good hard look at this object of interest? And even though everybody was kind of finished and they're like, oh, well, we got one that's enough, I was just like, no, that's not enough for me. What about something like this? What about something like that? Well, let's take a look. That is very interesting, too, as well, huh? If it's a ship, it's not big enough to be chalked off. But who knows, we might solve another mystery. Great <laughs> job, guys. Great, great After job. all the sonar reading, we had two targets. And that's when the excitement really set in. Good spot, buddy. <laughs> yeah. That's great. But you don't know until you go and put your eyes on it. We all are walking to a dock. I mean the ship. <laughs> we want to get on, on the dock. <laughs> My name's Irving. Freshman year, I didn't like it because I was really quiet and I didn't know anybody, so I was an outcast. It was just lonely. My mom is from Laos or my dad's from Thailand. My parents are not like American parents. They said, oh, yeah, go. It's going to be wonderful. I've never gone away from home. They don't let me. And this is like one thing you really want, so you must fight for what you want. I think I'm like a bird. I like being free or something. They finally say yes, and I was like, yay!
I always said, I would never go on the ship. <laughs> it's too scary. But I'm going on the ship. Yeah, that's our target we're shooting for. Really to get the word. Let's go fishing. We went on the boat, and the goal here was to drop a sensor as close as possible to our feature of interest. As a ship moves along its path, the towfish, which is dragging near the seafloor, searches the water along the ship's side. Side scan sonar continuously records the return echo, thus creating a picture of the seafloor. Hard objects protruding from the bottom send a strong echo and create a dark image. To be able to acquire data in real time on a laptop is something that we would not have foreseen five years ago. What you're seeing right now is the actual, the real-time side scan sonar data. So, Taisha, you're probably going to be the first person to actually see it. So, so screen something out if you see it. OK. When we was on the side scan, I was kind of nervous because he put me in a position of power, I guess you could say. And I didn't really know what I was looking for. I'm kind of nervous. What if I miss it? Are you seeing it yet? Yeah, I've seen something, but right, I'm not excellent. sure. Oh, hey, what is that? Shadow, wow, look at that. That's the bow. We're looking at what we think is the ship and its shadow. Uh, you can see the pointy end, the bow it appears to be, is the actual part of the ship sticking way off the bottom. You can see the curvature of the stern. For one thing's clear, we now know that our target is a ship. Maybe you're looking at the Choctaw, finally. <laughs> the Choctaw went down, tipping over, just like the picture showed that the boat on here was tilted over. All right, team. The first ice can wreck. Good job. But then the excitement notched up even higher with the second target. Oh, what is that? There's two. Ship. It was clear it was a ship. The side scan picked out everything. That's definitely something. It was just like, oh, we gotta go down there. <laughs> we gotta go see it. There's no question about it. The target is a shipwreck. It could be the Ironton. There was another one. The MF Merrick was 137 by 25. Yeah, we got a new mission and more research to do. <laughs> so one of our uh, one of our main tools in going down and, and looking at the stuff that you guys find will be an ROV. We were using ROVs, which are remotely operated vehicles. So we've got a 3D camera up here, a 2D camera down on the bottom, and a whole lot of lights. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys are gamers, but you know, it's joystick control. Oh, I really wanted to drive the ROV. Well, it has joysticks, it has dials, and like a couple buttons, like snap, it sounds like a video game controller. <laughs> well, first of all, this is Becky and Dave Schott. Um, yeah. They're part of a closed circuit woods hole dive team. Our dive, we're looking at around 300 feet, so we're not gonna stay down very long, mostly because of the cold temperatures, 36 degrees. We're diving what's called a closed circuit rebreather. This allows us to stay down longer, uh, especially at deeper depths. It's a, a really awesome tool. Looks like the fog's kind of heavy. We're going to look for a ship that crashed in the fog. In, in a fog. the fog. <laughs> if we run into issues, if we're off the wreck, if it's too tough to dive, uh, there are some risks that aren't worth taking, and we always come back another day. Uh, we don't want anybody hurt. We don't want anybody killed. I just think about like like the movies and just like how people like die and see and falling off the water and stuff. I was like, it's kind of terrifying. I think we're here. Finally. We got on board of the Laurentian. We're moored over the target. Crew's ready. We're ready to drop an ROV. All right, come on up. We put the ROV in the water, and we watched it blow out to, you know, the first destination. We're, we're going to drop down a little bit. About 100 feet from the buoy, we can start descent. 
conditions didn't look that great. It looked very foggy, rainy, which can be a little disconcerting. The fog and with night coming, I don't know if that's such a hot idea to a 280, 300 foot dive. You know, I, I just don't know. I think we'd better wait until the other lead time. I think I that's think. a great idea. If a diver goes adrift in this fog, it would be very difficult to locate the diver. It's also the middle of the shipping lanes. But right now, we're probably not going to get in the water today. My goodness. We went downstairs, and we saw the computers and the TVs and the monitors. These are stylish. Wow. No, yeah, I can. We're seeing this real stuff in 3D. That's awesome. I got the chance to fly the RV. I'm more or less sail it. Back up a little bit. He's a natural. He could do ROVs really easily. He could get into it really good. And I was, I was quite impressed by him. We want to pick out key features that would be unique to Choctaw. Length, width, collision damage, cargo, and certainly the shape of the hull. If we can distinguish that hull shape and match it up with Choctaw, things are looking good. Once the RV got out there, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And the anticipation was rising extremely. This will be the moment of truth. Is it going to be the Choctaw? Is it not? Finally, we're going to go out and nail this thing and put it to rest where the Choctaw finally sank and give it a good ending. Oh, what's this? Oh, there you go. Tell me, tell me when he stops. Right there. It's right here. Oh, yeah. It's right here. When it did show up, poof, it was right there. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's beautiful. Else? Oh, my gosh. I was like, wow, this is a shipwreck. This was real. Real people were on this. This is astonishing. Another ladder? That's the stairs. Window, door, that's it. Why are we seeing collision damage there? I don't know. That's what I'm hoping for. It looks like it. That is. I've never seen a collision spot, but <laughs> if I did, that's one. <laughs> the damage on the ship's starboard side is relatively slight, in my opinion, although I have no doubt at all that it's a result of the collision. But I don't think it would account for flooding the hull and sinking it. Pat, the plan is that a bilge keel? It sure has that appearance, yeah. Does chalk to have bilge keels? Not according to the builder's plans. Well, one thing too, Pat, what? we didn't see a uh, true whale back snout either. No, nor is the deck consistent with whale back. Well, yeah, so. well, a true whale back, so. Yeah. There's no way we're going to be able to see the name on that. No. Everybody was kind of like hanging on to the idea that this is going to be a Choctaw and we have to make it, like, make ourselves believe that. But Pat and Jim, they was being skeptics. So we have another discrepancy here with the historic images of Choctaw. In the photographs, the pause hole is mounted right above a very large rub streak. And there is no such streak visible here on the wreck. We were kind of in denial, but you know, deep down inside we knew like, you know, guys, this probably isn't the Choctaw because of the way it was built, how it was laying, the architecture of it. So we were all bummed out. So guys, team. Looking at this structure, is there anything like this that matches Choctaw? No. Now we're firmly into mystery territory.
even though we have a lot of records of where they say the ship sank, people make bad witnesses to begin with, you know, and if you read the account of any shipwreck, you're going to have a couple different ideas of where the people on the ship actually saw it sank. I was still glad we found something, that we were the first people to see it. It opened up a new door, made the search more exciting, because if it was a Choctaw, then it would have seemed too easy. And you don't want it to be too easy, because then it's not interesting. Pat, is there anything in the records that talks about anybody else getting in trouble around here? Etruria was 414 feet long, 50 feet wide, built in 1902. We don't have a record right here of her cargo, but I'll check into that. This isn't a quest for the Holy Grail. The real grail is knowledge. The real grail is discovery. The real grail is the satisfaction of knowing that you've actually gone out there and done something that somebody else hasn't done. It's a good lesson in life, and that is sometimes you don't succeed right away. I have no doubt the Choctaw will be found, and it's just a matter of when. You didn't I have hope that it was a Choctaw. As long as it was a ship there <laughs> and not a rock, I was fine. <laughs> what fascinates me is an opportunity to fill in the blanks, and perhaps for families who wonder whatever happened to their ancestors, to be able to close that chapter. So we'll gather more information. And with that, maybe be able to identify the ship that we found. Here's how we're also successful. How many targets did we find? Two. Two. Yeah. And we know that target number two is a ship. We're going to go take a look at that and maybe figure out how that ship sank and who it is. The entire project gained more excitement. We did have a mission, but now we had a new one, and it was exciting. What's the coolest thing that you came across this far? We've learned the history of shipwrecks. It's surprising how many have crashed here. I think the coolest thing that I have come across is learning about the different technology that is being used to find all of these different discoveries. I feel like now I can't go back to my normal self. Like, I feel like I have to do something. Like, I have so much more inspiration. It's the best experience I've ever had. I felt as if I needed to put more into it than I had before because it was really happening. I set a higher goal for Okay. Three, two, one. When you see her, you might think she's like the quiet type, but when you get to know her, she can talk and she kind of funny. And my other ego is um, Yukon Lane. The winter day is really nice and beautiful. Looks like no clouds, and the wind is like, I think, normal. <laughs> normal? <laughs> I never really talk. In class, I'm quiet and I listen. This experience will actually help me come out of my shell a bit. All right, signing out. <laughs> the very last day out on our boat, and we get to see the most awesome ship in the world. We had to take all the information we learned from the past five days to then. We had to use all of that information, and we had to do it quickly. We were going through these articles, learning and reading new stories. May 18th, 1889, the R.P. Randy reports having been in collision with the schooner M.F. Merrick. Well, what are you guys learning? Got some clues? This is the Merrick, what we think to be the potential ship that's on the bottom of the lake right now. Awesome. We, we learned it together, you know, sort of reading along with the students. The Merrick is a 130-foot schooner, kind that would kind of run around the Great Lakes in the late 1800s. Cargo, 400 tons of sand. Furnace sand was a unique cargo for that area because most of the ships that had sunk were coal, iron ore, and timber. The Merrick was headed up past Thunder Bay to Lake Superior. It was really dark because of the fog, and so it was really hard to see. The Merrick was struck by a steamship. It was struck on the starboard side towards the bow. 
The Merrick sank quickly, just within minutes. There were five lives lost, four men and one female cook. You know, we're on the top of the water. This right here could be where people died. The team's role in the second mission was really to be the leader. We were expected to do everything. Hey, you might want to turn a little bit to the left. Left and the Perfect. We had to pick out where the divers were going to go. Search for a name first. That's like the first priority. They want something positive. So we went for the name and the number. You could swim underneath the first hatch to make it to the second hatch. And we'll try to buzz in and, um, you know, see if we can get some silt and just dig down and pull it out, see if we, we can find any sand. So we'll go down in two teams, just to, so you guys first, uh, and uh, we'll go down and pick up after you. These are very technical dives, and we are carrying a lot of equipment. There is a lot more preparation. You're not just throwing on a tank and jumping in the water. You almost look like an astronaut because somebody's helping you snap on dry gloves, and you, you just can't move because of all of the fleece and tanks that you're wearing. The divers have a very limited amount of time. It's about a five-minute run to the bottom of the water. It's so cold, it's so brutal, that they only have 10 minutes at the bottom of the lake bed. The depth combined with the cold really makes it a daunting dive. I mean, it's not the longest, it's not the deepest, but it was definitely among the toughest. I was a little concerned, actually, because it's a virgin wreck. Nobody's ever been there. Any little thing that goes wrong can be a major problem. The normal procedure is we get down with the vehicle and we locate the wreck, and then we sit there and let the divers follow our tether down so they get there as quickly as possible and don't waste time looking. Well, on the way down, we're driving towards the wreck. All of a sudden, we couldn't drive forward. We couldn't turn right with the vehicle. And we weren't on the wreck yet. And uh, we were still 100, 150 feet from the wreck site. Before the divers had made it to the floor, the ROV lost power. And it hit the bottom, and it was laying there. And then I don't know exactly what happened, but they lost it. And the second they lost it, everything went up in the air. Idea where the divers are going. The ROV just went down. So, uh, yeah, they're descending to nowhere. You know, we splashed the first team of divers, and I just called down and asked the ROV, and like, yep, we're, we're getting up to the wreck. And then they splashed, they're on their way down, come down, and I'm not, you don't see the wreck in the monitor. And you know, of course, I'm like, are we turning away? Where's the wreck? Well, we lost a thruster and were blown off the wreck and they're flipping the ROV on and off to try to reset things. The, the ROV should have already been on the wreck and the divers already went down. So now basically it means they're doing a 300 foot desert dive of nothing. There's no wreck. The ROV is on the wreck. Rich and Dave, if you can hear me, the ROV lost thruster for several minutes and got pushed away. Uh, if you can, stay with it, or uh, jump ahead if you see the wreck. You have guys that are diving down to 300 feet. You're asking a lot of them, but when you send them down and it's a dirt dive, that's, you know, that that's just not fun. The divers had to follow at least 100 yards of tether that was just laying on the floor. It wasn't going anywhere. He's got to really pull in tether. Wow. A lot of it. Pulling the 10MD tether fast. It's all about just knowing and anticipating what each other needs, looking out for each other. They had to restart the power, and it had powered back up, but it was still off target. You're on the bottom right now. Just gently drive up. Try 
turned towards me a little bit more. A little tear left. Driving an RV made me tense up so much that my hands were so stiff that I literally had to start shaking them just to get the blood back flowing into them. I was really tense. He's picked up Slowly. video right, mm -hmm. right now. I'm sorry. That's the moment when I black out the world. An explosion could go on and I would stay on that RV. I really, really was losing hope because the divers, they could have went to nowhere. Then our day would have been over. Oh, oh, you got something right in front of you. Oh, oh my God. Oh. There she is. Oh my Whatever God. she is. <laughs> when the ROV had pulled up and it really got eyes on the shipwreck, it was kind of like the white in the darkness. When we found the ship, we was all just watching the screen, like not saying nothing, hoping like we would see something distinctive. And we ended up finding a big wreck hole. We're the first human eyes to see this since this thing went down. Unlike the other one that was tipped over, all you could see was the bottom. But this one had like more features that you could look at, like the bow, the stern, and the railing. You could see everything. The whole boat was described through the pictures. It really did just look like a pirate ship. It made me feel awesome. It's like all those years I got yelled at for playing video games too late paid off. One of those magical moments that I didn't mess up anything. <laughs> hey, uh, ship hunt team, where, where was the collision damage on this boat? Starboard. Starboard. side. So we're looking good for that. There's so many different things that the divers have to look at in order to identify that ship. Sometimes you don't just swim down and find the bell with the name on it and the nameplate. It just doesn't work like that. So you have to look at individual parts and try and piece them together. And, and that does happen. That is identification. They just scanned over where the plate would be, and then they went straight to the hatch to try and find that official number. And Evan was looking around for the number, but he couldn't see it. I took the video array inside the wreck for the aft hatch forward. The kids wanted us to go down into the cargo and sort of dig up and see if there was any sand. Evan stuck his arm all the way in, and he just pulled it out, and he was throwing it in the air like, yes, this is something you guys wanted. We found something. He's showing us with his hand. Is he showing us the sand? All right, there, there you go. It was really emotional because people really, they did die in that wreck. You could feel it how sad it was, because those were people's wives or husbands, fathers or sons on that ship. The divers stayed down 14 minutes longer than they should have. They really pushed for us to try and find as much as they could. It really was a scary thing, but also amazing thing at the same time, because they really wanted to get it done for us. Whew. Really cold. I've never been so cold. I know. My lips are numb. But man, that was cool. Virgin breath. After getting to know the kids better and better over the last couple days and seeing their excitement, and I, I just, I wanted to be successful for them. I wanted them to be successful and inspired by by finding something on this wreck. So do you think the team, the Project Ship Hunt team, can go home confident that we discovered a ship and we know the name of it? With a high degree of confidence, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so you've got two masts, forward damage up by the bow, definite sand cargo. That's a beautiful, beautiful shipwreck. Yeah. I mean, to go back, that come without back here in a heartbeat. Without all the tethers and the cables. Oh. Yeah. 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 And that's it, ship hunters. You found a ship. And you found a pretty interesting one. But the ship hunt never really ends. And that's the exciting part of it. And I think that's what I would like you guys to go away with above anything else, is that there's still a lot to explore. So keep at it, ship hunters.
Ship hunting is the mystery of an abandoned story. Ship hunting is the experience of underwater glory. Envisioning the beauty of a sunken ship is beyond astonishing to a human eye because what has been forgotten for many years magically becomes alive. Ship hunting is the thrill of unwrapping something new and ship hunting is the gift that lies in the mysterious hearts of me and you. I'm sure that they will never look at any body of water quite the same. Like the rest of us, they'll always be wondering what's below. You know, unfortunately, we didn't find the chalked out during this project. It's, it's been elusive, but uh, eventually, you know, we'll, we'll find it and uh, we'll put an end to this chapter of the story. We'll continue to work with Stan and we'll just go back out and keep looking. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I never give myself enough credit. I think, like, I can always do better. This accomplishment helped me realize that I am better than what I think I am. I guess I would see confident now, because I talk a lot more now, I think, than I ever did before. And it's just like something you do that really makes you change in a good way. <laughs> before, I just wanted to go into straight into game design. Now, there's a door open to me. I didn't know there was there before. And that is ship hunting. It's really opened their eyes up to a million other things, a million possibilities. This experience affected me more than anything. I had dreams, but I never thought that I'd be able to accomplish them. I feel like I went beyond the boundaries, pushed past the limits, and I really achieved a goal that wasn't set. I think I worry too much about stuff. Before I went on Project Ship One, I was like nervous. So I guess you could say it kind of lifted my confidence up. <laughs> it totally transformed the way that I'm thinking about how we should engage students in learning. For our students to know that they've had a world-class experience, for the community to know that our students had a world-class experience, this is huge. The description matches. There are no other candidates that come even close to her measurements, the circumstances, the location. It's a, at least a 95% chance that what we've found is indeed the Etruria. Pat is 95% sure, and Pat is a skeptic. So if he's 95% sure, I'm like 110% sure. It is Eric. Oh, so I feel like I'm gonna let out a tear. <laughs> but that's amazing. Why do you why do you feel that way? Because now I know I actually completed it. Oh god. <laughs> well, oh. <laughs> well, that's pretty awesome. We found a ship. Education at its best engages and inspires. What they're doing is leaving behind a legacy that will be here for a, a long time. A legacy of a ship found, of stories resolved, of a place that people can visit and connect to. In many ways, this isn't just a ship hunt. This is a lesson about life.